All right, welcome to the fundamentals of workspace. So, how many of you realize that this is a 10 part series? All right, so just so you know, the doors are being locked, so you're stuck here until tomorrow afternoon. So, <laughs> hope you brought your toothbrushes, hope you brought your pillows. We're going to be here a while. Um, so, we're going to get into this because we have 90 minutes, and if you've been into my sessions before, you know I have lots of slides, and, and we do. Uh, so, what we're going to do is talk about the workspace. And we're going to end up is building this entire environment. Um, so in this session, we are going to put all these pieces together. We will end with a workspace environment that gives you local and mobile apps, uh, SaaS web apps. Um, it'll give you the virtual apps, browser apps, even your content applications. And so we're going to build out this entire architecture you know, from beginning to end and show you, you know, a lot of the video demos of how you actually integrate these components. And then the sessions that follow, two through 10, we'll dive deeper into each of these different topics and provide additional you know, clarity, additional you know, recommendations, design considerations, uh, additional functionality in, in, into these different things. So Dan, let's take a vote. Both of us have two sessions that we're presenting, this one plus another one. I'm going to be presenting analytics, and he's going to be doing passwords or something boring. So <laughs> who's going to be attending the analytics session and join me tomorrow? Come on, guys. Analytics. <laughs> and who's going to be going to Feller's boring password session after lunch? No, right. no. Right, analytics. So, so passwords, come on. We have a dot. I don't know. We, we, had a, we have a uh, dollar bet to see who'd get the biggest cheers, and I, unfortunately, I think you won. I think Feller is famous, <laughs> but I promise you analytics will be way more fun. All right, so we're going to talk about into the whole workspace thing, and, and we're going to start the beginning here. Um, so we look at the beginning of the workspace. There's a lot of firsts, and I want to talk about some of my first experiences in my life. Now, these are all you know, safe for work experiences, just so you're aware of this. Um, <laughs> So this was my first Citrix conference in 1998. It was called Thinergy. I'm not sure if that was a logo, but I couldn't find a, a Citrix Thinergy logo on Google anymore. Um, so I'm not sure what it looked like. This was my first tech update session uh, in 2014. And those of you who are going to tech update this year, I am not presenting it anymore. After that many years, I'm done. But it's still here with other great presenters and great content. So. I would say don't skip it, but then it conflicts with the, uh, the, this Geek's Guide workspace uh, series, so stay here. Um, this was my ch first Chuck Norris joke that I told in one of my sessions. <laughs> and then uh, that was my first workspace. And so a lot, of us, a lot of us had started here. And if you think about it, this is actually true. Your workspace environment is where you get all your apps, all your content, you get all your work done. On, all your devices. I only had one device. All my files are right there. All of my applications are right there. That was my first workspace. Now, as we move forward, things have changed. I mean, things have grown. So now, instead of you know, a single Chuck Norris fact, I've done many Chuck Norris facts over the years. Um, that's just a fraction of them. And in the concept of a workspace, we now have something like this. We have all these different devices. You know, you got mobile devices, you got tablets, you got even these smart Alexa devices and Google Home devices that are spying on you constantly. Uh, you also have all the different applications. You know, you got your web apps, your SaaS apps, your Windows apps, um, just apps on all these different type of types of devices. Like even on the Alexa device, I have the uh, the, the Chuck Facts <laughs> skill, so you can ask Alexa, you know, give you a Chuck Facts. I do one every day for my kids. They love it until it did the one where it basically ruined Santa Claus for him. So I got in trouble for that one. Um, <laughs> and then we have all this content. This content is everywhere. Uh, you got cloud content. And so for me, I'm, I'm extremely cheap. Um, I have my files in Google Drive, in OneDrive, in Dropbox. Any place that's going to give me free storage, I'm going to use it. So my, I have content everywhere. And then, of course, I also have local and network storage as well. Uh, so all these things are everywhere. And what this ends up is that I have a complete environment that's, com that's just total chaos. And I since I have multiple devices, what ends up happening is I have multiple workspaces. Each device becomes its own workspace. And then I'm trying to figure out which of these applications do I have to have on each of my different workspaces? And then which of the content from all those different repositories do I need on each of those workspaces? You know, reconfiguring, you know, adding all these different things on there, all these devices, just a real big pain. Um, so what we want to do is 
uh, is take where a lot of us are right now with this whole concept of storefront, and we want to expand this out. We want to fill in the blanks here, fill in what's missing. So right now, what we have here is Windows applications and desktops. We have Linux applications and desktops. But what we're missing is the web apps. We're missing the SaaS applications. Uh, so we want to look at, as part of, as part of this session, is, is how do we start at storefront, and how do we start incorporating the SaaS and web applications into our storefront model, and then expand out further into the whole workspace. So then at the end, what we end up having is all these different devices plugging into a single workspace that's not tied to a device anymore. Uh, every device can get to the same workspace experience, and then that workspace then gets you to all the content that you need uh, for you know, anything that you're trying to access. And to do that, we use Workspace App. So who here is familiar with Workspace App? I would hope all of you guys. All right, so Workspace App is a foundation, right? It is what allows me as a user to have my workspace no matter where, whatever device I have. And this, for me personally, I tell my husband all the time I am spoiled. I will never be able to work anywhere that doesn't give me this flexibility because I'm no longer tied to that device. I can use my Chromebook, I can use my MacBook, I can use my phone, I can use his computer, my mom's computer, my sister's computer, whatever it may be. And the reason being is because I have Workspace app. Workspace app underneath the hood has different engines that give me that ability to access different types of applications. So I would say most people in the room here are pretty technical. Um, so you know that different applications have, you know, live on different backends. But most end users aren't technical, right? If you think about my mom, my grandma, my grandpa, they're not technical at all. And they just want things to work. They just want to be able to click on the application. They don't care if it's living on OneDrive, Google Drive, Cloud. I don't even think they know what a cloud is. Um, they just want it to work. The other cool thing about the Workspace app is we've now added auto updates. So I know in my previous life when I worked a lot, I was a sales engineer and worked with customers. One of their biggest pain points was updating receiver. I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate to that. So we've added that auto update functionality into Workspace app. The Workspace app has different flavors, right? So it has a desktop for Windows or Mac. It has a mobile for iOS, Android. And it also has a web app, right? So this, the web app is HTML5 based. And they serve different purposes. So for example, I have the desktop app on my corporate device. I have my mobile app on a phone and tablet. You can use a web app for like a public kiosk, et cetera. I personally use it when I need to use someone else's computer, like my husband, my mom's, et cetera. I don't want to go and do the full install of the Workspace app, so I just use the web app. I'll then authenticate into Citrix Workspace, and the resource feed will give me access to all my applications. Again, no matter whether they're SaaS, web, files, et cetera, I have my full um, Workspace on the go. Bad thing is that now Dan, my manager, I have no excuse because I have all my apps and everything on the go, so I have no excuse to say that I can't work. We do have, who here is familiar with TechZone or Tech Insight? If you haven't checked it out, go check it out. Our team creates that. We create tech videos, um, articles, all technical for you guys to consume, and we actually have one on Workspace app. So if you want a deeper dive, that's actually a better picture to take. Um, there's a QR code or techzone.citrix.com, and we publish great articles, great videos, um, architecture diagrams for you guys to consume. All right, so with, with you know, when now that we have Workspace app, we can start expanding our environment to start including the, the SaaS and web applications. And what we're going to do this with is using the gateway service. So it's like gateway on-prem, except it's a lot easier. Basically, flip a switch, and it's running. Um, so this is good for someone like me who knows absolutely nothing about networking, uh, that I can now actually set up a gateway. Uh, so let's take a look at to see you know, what we're, how we're going to walk through this and, and add additional functionality in our workspace environment. So this is what we're going to start with, is have a workspace experience that includes our Windows apps and desktops. So this will be step one. We need to incorporate that on-prem virtual app and desktop environment that we have deployed and incorporate that into our workspace experience you know, running in the cloud. After that, the second step is to add single sign-on to SaaS and web applications so that they will appear within our workspace environment. So the first part is site aggregation. Um, so what we end up doing is 
very high level, user will connect to Workspace. Workspace will use site aggregation to pull in all of the resources, all of the published applications and desktops that you have within your on-prem deployment. You know, this is your Citrix virtual apps and desktops. Everything's running on-prem. Um, but we'll be able to tie that into uh, the Workspace experience. So let's look at an architecture that we're going to be very familiar with. We have a user who connects the gateway that's running in the DMZ. Uh, the gateway service or the gateway talks to storefront, the delivery controllers, and talks to all the different resources that we have: published apps, published desktops. Um, we also have an internal user who is accessing the environment differently. You know, of course, they access it directly from storefront. So, after the keynote yesterday, you know, we heard all you know the story about Maria and how you know Workspace makes her life easier. So, I want to introduce you to Chuck. So, let, so here, here's, this environment works really well. It has for years. But there's ways we can improve this to make, to make it even better. So some of the challenges we have are there's a network device to manage. There's multiple network devices to manage because you don't want to have one because it's a single point of failure. That means the virtual apps and desktops admins have to deal with a networking team. Nobody likes dealing with a networking team. So, this is an issue. Uh, the second thing is that we have firewall rules. You notice that Chuck is in front of the firewall rules because nobody gets in front of Chuck Norris, so we had to move that over to get out of the way. So there's firewall rules that we have to open up um, to let the gateway talk to storefront, to delivery controllers, to Active Directory. Uh, so we have to, again, talk to the networking team, which we don't want to do. Uh, there's also public IP addresses. You have to have a public IP address to get to that gateway, you know, fully qualified domain name with certificates that you have to now manage. Uh, you also have to deal with multiple sites. Because if you're looking you know, for single points of failure or you have a, you know, a large deployment, you're going to have multiple sites. And how are you going to distribute load across multiple, you know, those different sites? And how are you going to do that? Um, and so what we want to do is we want to change this. We want to try to make it easier. And so what we end up doing is get rid of the gateway that's running in the DMZ and use Workspace with the gateway service that's running in Citrus Cloud. So now what's going to happen is that we deploy a set of cloud connectors within the on-prem environment, within the on-prem data center. What these will do is when they start up, they create an outbound connection to the Citrus Cloud services, the Workspace and the gateway service. So these are outbound connections that remain open. So there's no firewall changes that need to be made. So this allows the gateway and the workspace to then talk to and communicate with the internal resources through that outbound control channel. So now what happens is uh, a user, you know, they connect to workspace, finds the list of resources, and then they use the gateway service that makes that secure connection to, to their virtual desktop or their virtual application. So what we end up having here is, you know, all the issues that we had before, there is no networking device to manage. It's gone. Uh, Citrix manages it. There's no public IP address because the public IP address is workspace uh, experience in the cloud. Uh, there are no firewall rule changes because that cloud connector is creating outbound channels. So there's no inbound. There's nothing inbound. The inbound stuff goes through those control channels, which are initiated going outbound. So that's how we're able to get around uh, of, of open up all these different firewall ports. Uh, the Gateway service is a global deployment. I think it's 12 POPs, points of presence around the globe. Um, and then it will automatically direct the user to the most appropriate gateway service. Uh, so you, get the you end up getting the best experience. Um, and then the user gets the same experience. Whether you're internal or external, you're still going to hit workspace that's external. So everyone's going to follow the same path. Everyone's going to have the same policies applied to them. Uh, regardless of where they're being, regardless of where they're located. So, with this, what we end up having now is by adding that gateway service in here, we're able to do that whole site aggregation uh, uh, for this. So, we'll go through the the video demo of how you actually set this up, uh, just so you get an idea of how easy this actually is. So, within the cloud environment. Um, I already have set up a resource location. So I've got two cloud connectors set up for this particular resource location. One's offline. Um, that's why it's orange. But I have two, so I still have connectivity uh, to that on-prem environment. So then if I, <clears throat> I'm just verifying that I can talk to my domain. And so you can see my domain's available. Um, 
again, it's just telling me it's only reachable by one connector because the other one's offline, uh, but it's still available. I go ahead and configure workspace. I have a public URL I've configured for this, so you don't have to remember some crazy alphanumeric thing. Um, so this is very easy for a user to remember initially to get connected. And then under the, uh, under the, the sites, um, we're going to go ahead and incorporate our site, our virtual app and desktop on-prem site with this. So the first thing we do is select the resource location. This links with our uh, cloud connectors. We give it the IP or fully qualified domain name of one of our delivery controllers. And then, of course, we've got to authenticate. This would just be like admin accounts for your delivery controller um, so, you can, so the system can be able to contact it. It's going to test to make sure it's working, that it can communicate with it. And once that's done, we're going to go ahead and configure uh, um, the domain. So I only have one domain. That's the one I want to use. And then which gateway? Do I want to use an on-prem gateway, which you can. But here, I want to be very easy, because what we're talking about is simplifying all this for the admin. Uh, we'll go ahead and use the, the gateway service and save, finish, and done. So now, when a user launches Workspace app, they should get all those applications, all those desktops that are available uh, within our internal environment. So the user's going to go ahead and just quickly do a refresh. So there was nothing there. And then when they refresh, what we'll see is this thing should just populate uh, with apps and desktops. There's no recent or no favorite shift because it's a new user. Um, but if you click into uh, apps and all applications, you'll see the list of, of the applications that are available for this particular, for this particular user. Um, I always get comments about the weird applications I have here, uh, like Minecraft and City Skyline. So I, I run a, a uh, virtual app and desktop environment in my house, so my kids stop fighting over who gets the good computer. Uh, so that's why I have all those. <laughs> um, but that is basically the, the, the setup of using the site aggregation of, of maintaining your, your virtual app and desktop environment you have on-prem not even touching it. We didn't make any changes to the on-prem environment, and we were able to easily incorporate that into, into the whole workspace experience. Uh, so it makes it really easy. Now, the second part of this using Gateway is single sign-on. So single sign-on is extremely important. How many of you here have SaaS applications in your environment today? If you haven't raised your hand, that's very shocking because SaaS applications are something that are growing tremendously. So the gateway service not only provides <coughs> access to virtual apps and desktops, like Dan mentioned, you can integrate with your on-prem virtual apps and desktop environment, but it also provides single sign-on for SaaS applications. So things like Concur, Workday, Salesforce, you name it. It also provides single sign-on for web applications. So let's take a look of why it's important and how we do this. So like I mentioned, just talking to a bunch of my customers, um, SaaS is something that's exploding in everyone's environments, right? I've had customers who have straight up told me, Anna, we're SaaS first, and if that application can't be a SaaS application, then we'll look at delivering a different way. And so with that, with the SaaS applications, you have different credentials that your users need to memorize, different URLs that your users need to memorize in order to be productive. And so it's a lot of wasted productivity. Right? I'm sure we're all familiar with the pain of resetting your password and meeting the specific complexity rules that that specific application requires, coming up with crazy passwords and trying to figure out then how do I remember those passwords, right? <laughs> so for your end users, it's a pain, but also as an organization, this can create a security threat because if they're not meeting these complex passwords or they're writing it down in a post-it note, Excel file, whatever, it just opens up your environment to for a potential breach. And so how does it work? Essentially, Gateway Service provides single sign-on to your end user's local browser. And so behind the hood, how it works is for your traditional SaaS applications, it works using SAML. And then for your web applications, so these are the applications that are living within the four walls of your data center, you need to install something called the Gateway Connector. This is a virtual appliance that will go inside your DMZ and will provide that secure external outbound traffic to provide that SSO for your web applications as well. So let's take a look of what setting that up looks like. You'll go into your cloud services, hit Gateway Service in order to configure that SSO, and you'll go into the single sign-on Get Started. So Dan already did the site aggregation, so we'll go ahead and look. We have templates for over 150 SaaS applications, probably more at this point. 
Um, but you also don't need to use a template, right? This is just making it easier for certain SaaS applications. You'll go ahead, type in the name, type in the URL for that specific application. In this case, we're doing Humanity. So once we type that in, you can change the icon for your end users, change the description. For now, we're going to skip enhanced security. Dan will be covering that shortly. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Once we type in the URL, there's going to be certain configurations that you need to do on the SaaS provider. And so we'll click on that link right there that will give you an XML file with all the information that you need to input into the specific SaaS provider. And so right now, we're going to go into the Humanity app itself as an administrator to set up and complete that SSO. So we're going to go into settings in the upper right-hand corner, scroll down to single sign-on to complete that configuration. Again, we make it very easy because we'll give you that XML file so that you can get all the information that you need, including the identity ID as well as the certificate. So you'll see us copying it over and pasting it into the Humanity application to complete that setup. So I'll enable SAML, copy that, go copy the certificate, and this will allow the single sign-on from Citrix workspace into that specific SaaS application. So you would follow a similar process for all your different SaaS applications out there, save those settings, go back to the gateway service in order to complete some of that configuration, and then once we hit save, we'll go ahead and finish that. And now that application will be available within my Citrix Cloud library. So the library is where you assign users to that specific application. And so now I'll go into the Citrix Cloud library and manage my subscribers. You can give access to a specific user or a specific AD group. Again, we're pulling those from the cloud connectors that Dan showed earlier. So I'm going to give it access to all domain users. And now let's take a look at what the end user side looks like. One of the cool things is that you'll notice that Max doesn't have to log out in order to get access to Humanity. All he needs to do is refresh those applications. So you can dynamically give users access to their applications without them having to disrupt any of their workday. And you'll go ahead and launch Humanity. <clears throat> and you'll notice that it'll actually open up in his local browser in Firefox, right? Dan will talk about some of the other options when it comes to security that you can give your end users. But this is a great user experience. They don't have to remember their complex passwords anymore. They have everything they need within their workspace, and they just have to authenticate once. And so Gateway Service right, it has a lot of features and benefits. I think a huge one is that SSO into the SaaS applications. SaaS applications are something that are very relevant today and I think will continue to grow um, within all enterprises. So the next part is building on top of that. You know, so we have the single sign-on, but we want to increase the security, enhance the security for those SaaS and web applications. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons. I mean, it's very easy to bring a USB thumb drive and start stealing data. Um, but if you ever put that thing in right the first time, go buy a lottery ticket. Um, it, it's fascinating. It's, it's like a 50-50 chance that you should insert that thing right. And it never comes. It's like for me, I'm like 90%. I'm always incorrect. Um, and there's also phishing attacks. You know, you get a URL, you click on it, and then you get a site that looks like Facebook, but it's not Facebook because when you actually look at the full URL, that is not the Facebook URL. Uh, so we need to protect users. It's not, you know, we always like to make fun of the users and say stupid users and all that, but honestly, it's very easy to get fooled by something like this. You know, they, they become really intelligent of, of masking these things, and how, I don't know how many of you look at the bit.ly links, you know, those little shortened URLs that you get and figure out what they are before you click on them. And even something you see like www Facebook, it's like, oh yeah, I'm going to go there. Uh, but you don't look at the full URL to realize that's not the actual one you want to go to. So what we want to do is we want to enhance security for these SaaS applications and web applications to protect the users. So what we just did before is we have workspace, we didn't have enhanced security, and the user would be single signed on to that particular web or SaaS app. What we're going to do now is when you turn enhanced security on, what ends up happening is uh, if you're using Workspace app, the, uh, the desktop version, you know, um, Anna talked about those three different variations of Workspace app. This would be the full desktop version. There's the embedded browser. You know, all those engines she talked about, one of those was an embedded browser. So when enhanced security is on, you're using that full Workspace app on the desktop, that web or SaaS app will run within that embedded browser. 
So it'll, it'll feel like a, a native browser for you. It all runs locally, and you have that exact same experience, except now we're able to do security policies on top of this. We can do watermarking. We can disable um, printing, uh, navigation. Uh, so we can do other things to this. And also, any URLs that you might click within the SaaS application, we're going to assess and decide whether the user has access to it. So either say, no, you don't, or yes, you do, and we'll allow it, or we can then redirect you to secure browser. So here I'm in the embedded browser, which is that engine inside a workspace app. But then we have a secure browser, which is it's a published browser that's running in the cloud. And what it's essentially doing is it's breaking that direct connection from your endpoint device to the internet. So we're breaking that and running a disposable browser in a cloud environment. So it gets built when you start it, and it gets destroyed when, you're, when you close it. So it's a disposable browser. All your, any data, anything you download on there gets destroyed, gets erased um, when you close that session. Uh, and, then any, and so all this is basically is breaking that link. So any malware, anything that you get from the internet will not make it down to the endpoint device. So for certain things, we, want to, we might want to redirect instead of allowing it within the embedded browser or denying it outright. Uh, so that was using Workspace app desktop. When you use Workspace app web or mobile, what ends up happening is um, when enhanced security is turned on, they don't have that embedded browser engine. Uh, so what ends up happening is they launch secure browser instead when you have that, when you have that turned on. And then the URL filtering, the website filtering that we have uh, will follow the same process. We'll deny it. We'll allow it. Or we we'll redirect it to secure, secure browser. But because we're already in secure browser, we're not going to redirect to ourselves. We're going to go ahead and then just essentially allow it. Um, so allow and redirect ha has the same end result when you have a secure browser instance running. And some of you might be thinking, it's like, it's a SaaS application. This is coming from Salesforce. I trust Salesforce. I trust humanity. I trust these SaaS applications. Why do I need someone to validate these URLs? Outlook is a SaaS application with Office 365. Hopefully, we all know not to randomly click links that come in Outlook. Um, we can trust Salesforce, but do you trust data that someone's put in there? Because you can easily add URLs to all these different SaaS applications you know, in messages and comments, and users can click on them. Uh, so what we want to do is protect the user from that. So kind of show you, we'll show you how you would end up doing this. Um, so we didn't turn it on. We didn't turn enhanced security on, and we've created the humanity application. So we're going to go back in here and just edit this. And so we go through the settings. We don't change anything except for right here. We turn it on, and we're just going to, we won't restrict navigation. We'll restrict everything else, but not navigation, so you'll be able to navigate within the application. Um, and then with that, we go ahead and hit next, 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 save. And so we now have enhanced security turned on. Uh, the second part is the website filtering. So here's where we begin to access control and determine which of these websites uh, do we want to allow, deny, or redirect. And you get to break this down on um, URLs or categories. So here we're going to go ahead and get rid of all the fun stuff that we have on the internet, the malware and the spam, peer and torrents, adult stuff, gambling. So we're going to make the internet very boring. Uh, so we're blocking all this stuff. Uh, so if you try to click on this, you'll be denied access. Uh, anything that deals with social networking, we're going to redirect to secure browser. So that is now set up. And you can go back and actually set specific URLs. So you could just set maybe you want to allow Twitter, but you want to redirect everything else. So you can do that as well. So here I launched the application. What you notice is this is no longer Chrome or Firefox or Edge. This is now the embedded browser. And you can see I have the watermark for my user. Tried to click on, I believe you tried to click on Pirate Bay. That was blocked. Uh, if we go back, um, user's going to go ahead and, and click on, if I remember the demo right, it goes to Facebook now. And my personal belief is Facebook should be blocked too. <laughs> I don't like Facebook. But uh, um, what you see happening now is it's launching a secure browser instance. And user will be able to get access to Facebook, but yet it's not running on their endpoint device. It's running in a temporary browser in a cloud. And so they'll be able to use Facebook and do whatever they need. When they shut this thing down, that browser instance goes away. And anything that got pushed down to that machine where the browser's running gets erased um, from, from that device. So 
We've now expanded this out a little bit. We've now incorporated access control. We've incorporated secure browser into this whole architecture. And what this ends up doing is it gives us an enhanced security. It's giving us uh, you know, no data left behind uh, for those browser instances. It's also incorporating you know, the website filtering and, and giving us some analytics that we have uh, for what users are doing on the environment. And we'll talk more about analytics later in this session. Uh, but so again, there's another whole video on this that goes even deeper onto access control, again, on the tech zone. Um, you'll see this reoccurring theme throughout. Uh, but now we move into the endpoints. So let's talk about the endpoints themselves and how we can control local and mobile applications, right? Citrix Workspace has the ability to connect back to local and mobile applications as well. So giving the user that full workspace, depending on what endpoint they're connecting to, right, which we'll talk about. So if I'm connecting from a mobile device, I may have access to certain applications that I wouldn't have access if I was connecting from a full desktop. And so just a couple of statistics out there. I think everyone in this room, I would be shocked if I get one person that doesn't have a mobile device. Is there a person in this room that does not have a mobile device on them? Yeah, that's what I thought. Well, I have it. Why don't we take a famous selfie? Come on, Dan. Let's do it. <laughs> Jeez. Awesome. So now that we've done that, um, we know that this is very prevalent, right? And so whether or not your organization has a full-on mobile device policy, it's something that should be on the back of your mind, right? Whether you have a proper full BYO policy, whether you're giving out corporate devices, the reality is that both in corporate devices and personal devices, most users have a combination of both personal applications as well as work applications, right? And if you don't give them the tools to be productive, they'll find a loophole and then your environment won't be secure. So what I tell all my customers is you should have mobility as top of mind to figure out how can I please my end users and give them the productivity tools that they need while also making sure that my environment and that my intellectual property is secure. And this is not just mobile devices, right? Now we have tablets out there, we have full on desktops, where we also have personal applications and work applications. So how do we secure these? And how do we also make sure that for those personal devices, like the one I just took a picture with, that my company isn't being really restrictive, right? Because at that point, then I won't even want to use those work applications. And once again, I will try to find a loophole so that they're not um, completely taking over my personal device, but still where I can be productive. So how does this work? We have the Workspace app, which will communicate with Citrix Workspace, so similar authentication that we did in the full desktop. We'll do this in mobile. And then once we do that, the resource feed will talk to the endpoint management service. We'll determine whether this device needs to be enrolled or not in full endpoint management. If it's a MAM-only device, I think we have a very powerful tool to have only mobile application management where we don't control the device yet still secure our work applications. And then we'll communicate with Secure Hub. So Secure Hub is the application on mobile devices that is required to push down the device policies as well as the application policies for those mobile applications. And once that happens, now your end user will be able to download those local mobile applications. We'll talk a little bit more about app container in this next section and why it's important. If you don't have containerization, what happens is you have your work applications and your personal applications coexisting on the same device and sharing a lot of those underlying resources. What I like to tell my customers is that you don't need to have malicious users or malicious applications in order for your intellectual property to be at risk. If you know a little bit about how Facebook, Twitter, and some of the other common non-malicious applications work, they have APIs that in the background are constantly pulling information from the end user's device. So if you have those both applications coexisting, you run the risk of Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, et cetera, pulling information from some of your corporate devices. So how do we deal with, it, with this? We do it by containerization. So we essentially create an app container for your work applications. And now these work applications will have their own underlying resources that they talk to. The benefit of this is that we now have app-specific policies that we can set in order to protect your information while still giving your users the ability to be productive on mobile devices. Another huge challenge that we run into when we talk about mobile devices is connecting to internal resources. So how many times do you get a link in an email and you click on it and you can't actually render that link because it's an internal site, right? 
I know it happened to me before all the time. And so you could get a full VPN on a mobile device, but I can guarantee if there's anyone from security in the room, they'll say, it'll be a big no-no. Same thing, you don't want to give Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, a full VPN where they can now access all of your internal resources. And so the way that we deal with it is through a micro VPN. Who here is familiar with micro VPN and our technology? All right, awesome, that makes me very happy. So the way that a micro VPN works, it's essentially it creates a per app VPN and the key thing to this is that it does not require a full VPN profile on the device. So a lot of vendors out there, in order to give you this functionality, you'll need to push a full VPN profile, therefore you need to do a full device management. We don't do that, right? That device that you saw right there is not device managed, yet I have the ability to do a micro VPN, therefore I can access my internal resources when needed. And it's so powerful that Microsoft actually asked to partner with us in order to enable their technology to do this. And the underlying resources are ours, right? That technology is ours. So let's take a look of what that looks like. We'll go into cloud services, go into the endpoint management service, and again, this is where we're gonna be able to set those app-specific policies, and later in the presentation, we'll also show you how to do device management from the endpoint management service itself. The first thing that we'll do is we'll set up LDAP so that that device can communicate to your Active Directory. With Citrix Endpoint Management, you can actually do local users as well. We won't get into that today, but you have the, that ability of doing that if you have users that you need to give app, access to these applications that are non-AD users. Once we set that up, we'll go into the configuration to configure some of those applications. What we're gonna show here are two applications that come with our endpoint management service, which is our containerized email client or containerized web client, but you can do the same process for any homegrown applications. You can wrap these applications and you can do, follow the same process. So essentially what we do is we upload what we call an MDX file. This is essentially a policy file, right? So this is where you'll set your per app um, policies on the device and you could do this per platform. The reason why we've divided this out per platform is because different platforms give us access to different things. So an iOS doesn't have the same functionality than an Android device does, so we give you that granularity to do a per platform and per application. So you can do things like block copy-paste, block the camera from that, from that specific application, check for jailbroken or rooted devices, and like I mentioned, something that's very powerful is that you don't need full device management in order to set these restrictions and in order to check for things like jailbroken or rooted devices, et cetera. So once we go through this, we'll hit next and we'll give access to all users. Again, you could restrict this based on user groups, so depending who you want to have access to these applications. We'll follow a similar process and do it for our secure web browser so like I mentioned, if you have any homegrown mobile applications, you could use our wrapping service in order to have the ability of doing this as well and setting those applications to those homegrown, setting these policies to the homegrown applications. So we'll go ahead and approve that, give it to all users. Another cool thing that you can do here is you can actually do it so that not only do you assign it per user, but you also check things on the device itself. So maybe only allow it on iOS or maybe only allowed on certain versions of an iPhone or a tablet. And so it gives you the granularity to do both. So now we're gonna go ahead and mirror Dan's Android. You actually saw that I have an iPhone, but that's okay, we'll talk about that later. Um, and we'll launch the workspace application, right? And you'll notice that as soon as the user refreshes their application, they'll have access to secure mail and secure web. If that same user were to log on into the full desktop app, they wouldn't have access to that because these are mobile specific applications. So again, being able to contextually change that depending on the endpoint that the user is coming from. Once I click on secure mail, it'll redirect me to secure hub, which we talked earlier in the architecture diagram. And if the user doesn't have secure hub, it'll ask them to download secure hub. Like I mentioned, secure hub is the application that allows that communication to the endpoint management service and allows those specific application policies as well as device policies to be downloaded to the device and so that the user can follow that. 
So once I download Secure Hub, I'll now have access to the mobile applications. One of the big changes that we did from a couple of years ago is before you actually had to upload the full application to the, send to the endpoint management service, and that's where the user would download it from. Now we do it through the Google Play and the iTunes Store, so making it a lot easier for the end user to do updates and to download the applications. The only thing that we're pulling from the actual service itself is the policy. So what we upload at that MDX file is essentially a policy shell file. It'll ask the user whether or not they want to enroll. So in this case, the user won't enroll, right? So it'll be a MAM only situation. Again, this can be changed from an administrative perspective. So if you want to force the users to enroll in MDM or not give them the option, you can make those configuration changes as well. Once a user sets their PIN, their Citrix PIN, we'll now have access to all the applications, including that secure mail and secure web application. So when I go to add, you'll notice that it'll redirect them to the Google Play Store to download secure mail. A lot of customers ask me, well, what happens if I just go straight to the Google Play Store and download it? You could, but once you launch the application, it'll actually ask you to download Secure Hub and authenticate. These applications cannot be used unless you have Citrix endpoint management. So once we download Secure Web as well, we'll now have these applications locally living on the device, right? So these are local applications, and I'll be able to utilize them and do my day-to-day -day work. So one of the policies that we set is that app interaction between the applications. We want to restrict how these applications, which are work applications, interact with those personal applications. And so you'll notice that when Dan here clicks on the link, oh, another Chuck Norris <laughs> joke, but once he actually clicks on the link, it'll open up Secure Web. If this was an internal site, it would actually go through the micro VPN to, in order to pull that internal resource. Now, Dan is going to try to copy that URL and paste it into, I want to say, Google Chrome, which is a personal application. And you notice that when he does that, he won't have the ability of pasting that information. So yes, this is a URL. It's not a big deal. But think about if it's actual intellectual property that you want to protect, they wouldn't be able to do this. But if they go back into the other containerized application, so a secure mail, they would actually be able to copy that information over so you're not restricting the user, you're just giving them the tools to be productive while still protecting your information. So it's very powerful and I encourage all of you guys to take a look at it. Alrighty, so that was a lot. <laughs> so the endpoint management service allows you to do full um, device management, which we'll talk about later, but it also allows you to do just mobile application management. Again, most of our customers use this for BYO devices so that they can still protect the information and still give their users the productivity tools that they need um, without being super restrictive on the end user. And we do have a full text on video on MicroVPN, so if you want to go check that out, I encourage you guys to do so. So now we're going to talk about device management, right? And so I just talked about the application side of the house, which I believe is very important, especially for those BYO devices. But I also understand that there is a need for mobile device management, right? And so mobile device management um, is very important, especially for those corporate-owned devices where you want to restrict the end user what they're doing, block certain applications, block certain functionality from the end user. And so we're able to do this as well. So we talked about personal devices. Most of my customers would use just mobile application management in this regard. But we also have work devices that we need to lock down and restrict. And this is what we're going to talk about. This now goes beyond just your traditional iOS, Android, Windows, Mac. We're now also able to do this on IoT devices and other type of devices. And we have a full Geek's Guide session on it. Um, being delivered by Frank Serp sitting over there, so I encourage you guys to attend that as well. So how does device management work? At a high level, Citrix workspace, the user will authenticate, the resource feed will check into the endpoint management service and see if that device needs to enroll. If the device hasn't enrolled, it'll go through the enrollment process. We won't go through the full enrollment process today, just based on time. But once that device is enrolled, they'll talk to the different microservices within the endpoint management service in order to get the device policies, the application policies, the network policies, et cetera. So let's take a look at what that looks like. 
Now that we've configured the application itself, we're going to go into device policies and add some device policies. We've broken this down per platform because, again, like I mentioned, we're really dependent on the APIs that these vendors give out to us. And so we're going to go ahead and create a policy for Windows Defender. If it had more platforms available, those would show up on the left-hand side. You'll see that in the next policy that we set up. So once we set that up, we'll go ahead and hit Next and get that configured. Again, depending on the specific platform, the different policies that will be available for you to configure, for you to turn on or turn off. We'll assign that again to all the users or whichever users you want to assign that specific policy to, and then be able to do this for the different device policies depending on the platform itself. So the next one we're going to do, we're going to do the control OS updates, and we'll actually show you what the end user side of that looks like. So we'll do OS updates. You can look on the left-hand side that we have different platforms available for that. Um, so if you were to do it for the different platforms, you could do it within a single pl um, policy so that when you're actually, as an administrator, looking through your policies, it's easier um, to manage and to look through. Um, so we'll go ahead and set up some of that configuration. So we would go and set that up. Again, there would be different policies depending on the actual platform itself, just depending on how that device and how that platform works. So once we get that configured, and we turn on all those things, we're going to go ahead and hit Next and assign that to all users. So once we assign that to all users, we're going to set up one more device policy, and then we'll show um, how to set up some other types of applications as well. So I'll go ahead and I'll set, I would say, probably the most widely used device policy, which is a restrictions policy. So this is where you would be able to block things like your camera, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, et cetera. I would say this is one of the most popular device policies out there for all types of platforms. Um, so again, you would pick the specific platform or platforms that you want to set this for. And once you set that up, you would be able to do things like turn off certain Wi-Fi settings, connectivity settings, account settings, et cetera. So all these, all these policies are being set to the full device itself. So you saw earlier that we set it for the specific application, and there's a lot of things that match up, right? So you can set up, turn off the camera for just that application itself, or if you wanted to do it for the full device, you would configure it here as a device policy versus an application policy. But you do have that ability and flexibility of, depending on your use case, doing it in one place or the other. So we're going to go ahead and hit Next, assign that to all users, and save that. Now we're going to go back to apps and talk about delivering different types of applications, so not just your containerized applications. You can also push down, especially for um, enrolled devices, other types of applications, such as enterprise applications, so that you force users to have certain applications on that device. So in this case, Dan is going to go ahead and upload Google Chrome. In this case, you would upload either the EXE file, the IPA file, depending on what type of application it is. So I'm going to go ahead and select the Google Chrome um, EXE. And then once it gets uploaded, um, you'll notice that in this side, because it's not an MDX application, you don't have all that granularity of app restrictions or app policies that we had earlier. You just have a couple of things that you could put, like the description, the app version, et cetera, just so that the user knows what that application is itself. So once we go ahead and do that, we'll hit Next, and then assign it to all the users out there. Once we've assigned it to all the users, we're actually going to go into delivery groups. And there's two types of applications that we can deliver. You're going to notice that we're going to have required applications as well as optional applications. The required applications are applications that for enrolled devices actually get pushed down to the device, whereas the optional applications will still be within the Citrix workspace, within the user's catalog, but they're optional. So the user can go and self-pick whichever ones they want to download. So now we're going to go ahead and launch Dance Windows 10. This device is already enrolled, like I mentioned, due to time. We're not going to go through the full enrollment process. But one of the things that you'll notice is we made Chrome a required application. And if you look on the left-hand side in a couple of seconds, Chrome will actually appear. So without Dan having to do anything, go through the install process, we were able to push that application through the endpoint management service um, and have that application being installed. The same process would 
um, happen with mobile applications on mobile devices or other types of applications. So, drum roll. I guess we could have sped that up. Yeah, you could have. <laughs> so now any jokes? Three, two, one. Nope. There we go. So now Google Chrome is on that, um, that Windows device itself, and the end user can launch it just like they would if they had downloaded that application to the device itself. Um, just so that you know that we actually have this device managed, Dan is now going to go into the settings and show you that this device was already pre-enrolled, and he's going to show you that those OS update policies that we set are actually being applied to this device itself. So if you look at the update policies, you'll notice that it's um, being managed by a device management, which would be Citrix Endpoint Management. And so we're able to do those updates as well. Now we get into a little bit of the fun part, where we go back into the administrator's console, and we'll take a look at the devices that are enrolled within the device. So you see the Android tablet that I talked about earlier, as well as the Windows desktop. The Android tablet is MAM only, so it does not have device management, whereas the Windows desktop has full device management. And you'll see that Dan can actually go in and complete, do a full wipe of the device. And so this is the number one reason why I will not enroll my BYO devices, because I don't want someone accidentally doing a full wipe on my device. But if it's a corporate device, right, we need that ability sometimes to do a full wipe on the device. And we could do this, you'll actually notice it going on right now on the Windows 10. Um, you can do this manually, or you can also actually set actions where you say, hey, if this condition is met, I want an action to take place, so the system will, take pl will actually do the full wipe, the selective wipe, et cetera. So you'll see in a second that it will actually be rebooting and doing a full factory reset of the device. Just due to time, we won't go through that full factory reset, but I do want you guys to see in a second, it'll come up and you'll see it that it's starting the, the reset process of that machine. So it's a very powerful tool um, and something that you can utilize for those corporate owned applications, for those co corporate owned devices, excuse me. So you'll see that it's actually resetting that PC. So due to time, we're going to go ahead and get out of that demo. Um, but endpoint management, right, it gives you the ability not only to do the mobile application management, but also for those specific mobile device management use cases, you do have those tools and functionality within Citrix Workspace to do that. And so now I need a break, so I'm going to turn it over to Dan to talk about content. And you know, a lot of the different applications and desktops we're accessing are, there's not a lot of value in it unless you can actually get to your content. And so that's what we want to figure out is how do we incorporate all of our content into this environment. And so we build this out, and we're going to look at how all these different types of content repositories, how do we incorporate them into our, into our environment, whether we're doing a virtual app or virtual desktop, um, or using local applications, how do we get to that content? And so you, know, you always hear about how big is our digital universe, how much content is actually out there. And if you just look at you know, in 2015, there was four zettabytes, and now they're expecting in 2020 to be 44. And so you might be thinking, what the hell is a zettabyte? So, is that money gigabytes or bytes, kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes, exabytes, zettabytes? And we heard yottabytes yesterday um, in the uh, keynote. So that's the, that's the whole hierarchy of how much storage that is. So there's a lot of data out there. Um, so we're looking at how do you incorporate all this type of stuff. And the challenge we have is that what's the experience like for these different devices? So I've got virtual machines, I've got physical machines, I've got mobile devices. You can't have the same way of accessing the content across all these different devices because they have unique characteristics, which we'll go over in a little bit. You also have the choice. You have all this choice of where is the storage, where is all this content being located? Is it on-prem? Is it local? Um, is it in one of these different cloud providers or multiple cloud storage providers? You know, where is all this content at? And then finally, the security of it. Um, what type of security uh, rules and policies do we want to apply to different types of content? You know, do we want to al allow people to view it or edit it? Of course, you know, certain people should be able to edit it, but if you need to share that with somebody you know, external out of the company, maybe you only need view access, or there should be a watermark on it uh, so you know who actually printed this out or distributed it to a bunch of other people so you know who was the culprit for getting that data out and, and sharing it where they shouldn't have been. Uh, so when we look at content collaboration, what ends up happening here is how all this stuff fits together is that you know, your device connects to Workspace app, which talks to 
uh, workspace. So you should see this commonality across all these different services that we have. Um, the next part here is that, you know, we talked the resource feed microservice and it talks the content collaboration service, which gives us the, uh, gives us that link back into Workspace app, gives us the, the files, uh, gives us access to all of our files uh, within the Workspace app. Now, from the content collaboration service, there's a bunch of microservices that gives us additional functionality. You know, we can view the content. Um, there's a, the, the connector service that allows us to link to all these different storage providers, as well as the collaboration microservice. So let's look at these a little bit closer. So the first one is the, is the uh, connector. So this would allow you to use uh, local storage using storage zones. So you know we talked about these cloud connectors uh, at the beginning that talked about I'm going to incorporate my on-prem environment to Citrus Cloud with that outbound connection. You know, it's going to allow us to talk to the on-prem environment. And this, we talked about it from a virtual app and desktop deployment and being able to use your on-prem Active Directory to authenticate. Uh, with content, there's this whole thing called a storage zone and you have data connectors. And this is a very similar concept, is it's making that link from the content collaboration microservice to our on-prem environment to get to those file servers. Uh, so it's how we're able to be able to talk to those on-prem environments without having to do crazy firewall port changes and opening tons of stuff up uh, to the environment. Uh, the other part of this is there's connectors for, I guess, what you can call per your personal storage cloud. You know, all these different types of cloud providers like OneDrive, uh, Box, Dropbox, Google Drives. Uh, so this will all get integrated into the user's workspace environment. The second microservice to take a look at is the uh, viewing service, the content viewing service. So uh, the content collaboration service has built-in viewers. So if you get sent a link um, for a Word document, you might not have Word installed on your device. You know, depending on which device you're using, you might not have it. So there are viewers in there that let you view that document, um, Visio documents, video files, PowerPoint uh, presentation. So you don't have to have those applications installed to be able to, to view the content. Um, of course, you can't make changes to it. It's just a view. It's a read-only uh, situation here. Uh, but now if you need to edit it, what you can end up doing is there's, this all is based on where's the content stored at. So if my content is hosted in a cloud storage provider somewhere, I can either edit this with Office 365, you know, one of the, one of the SaaS applications as part of 365. I can edit this on the endpoint, or I could use a virtual application, you know, some, you know, a published application. Now, if the content is stored within a storage zone, you know, on a file share, um, I can access it from the endpoint, I can access it from a virtual app session, or from the Office web app server, but not from Office 365 SaaS app, because it doesn't have access to that repository. <coughs> it doesn't have access to that file share. So you could actually build a web server internally that hosts your Office web applications, and then you'd be able to use something like Office 365, you know, within a browser to edit those applications. Now, the last part is the collaboration service. So this is changing your workflow. And, you know, people don't like change, and, you know, they're used to when they need, when they need to send a document out. Usually it's for something like this. They want feedback on a document, or they need approval for something, or, they, or they're trying to gather requests. And what ends up happening here is you send an email out with an attachment. It's like, hey, to like 10 people, it's like, can you review this? Now all of a sudden you start getting replies back. Some people respond with, with you know, notes in the document. Other people just delete it and ignore it. And now you have all these different files coming in or some are missing. You don't know, you don't know if you actually got everything you needed. You might have deleted them. You might have saved them somewhere and you forgot where. So you start losing all this information from people who actually did work for you and helped you out and you lost the, you lost the valuable insights. So with these, mic with these uh, um, collaboration services can do for you is it just it changes the workflow. It basically brings everything together. So instead of sending the document out, uh, you start this workflow. And you send this, you send this workflow out to all these users and they can actually go into an online document and start making comments. And what's actually really interesting about it, it, it actually forces other people to make comments as well or to actually review it. Because what you end up seeing is uh, as you're reviewing it, you see who's actually reviewing it and you see who's submitted, who's submitted their, their feedback. And you see, uh, you see a list of other people who haven't submitted anything. And of course, when somebody submits feedback, it goes out to the whole email list. So you, st so you start things like, oh crap, my manager replied to this and has already provided feedback. I better go out there and provide feedback too. 
So it's a good way to actually force people to uh, provide feedback on these type of documents because um, there's, this, there's this trail of who's, who's actually you know, looking at these things and, and making comments and trying to provide value to, to this information. So it's one of these workflows, it's, it's so easy to send an email. Once you start using something like this, you don't go back to email. Um, you start using these new type of workflows. So let's take a look at you know, how this all gets incorporated into, into our environment. Um, so, whoops, I hit the button. I gotta back up. <laughs> Here, I'll back up for you. I have the powerful clicker. All right, so, it is, is it starting? Video. There you go. All right, so we'll go into the content collaboration service here, and we're going to set this up for a, a particular user. We're going to set this up for, for one of our users. Uh, so we haven't added anyone yet. This was a new environment. So we'll go ahead and add uh, uh, Max and add him as a, a new user within our content collaboration service. So give a tie to the email address for this particular user. You can give a password or not. You might be wondering, why would I have a password? Or why wouldn't you require a password? Um, so this is allowing you to get into the website itself uh, if you're going to make a direct connection to that website, you know, to um, the sharefile.com site. And so you go ahead and give it the password. You can give different user settings, the different levels of access the user has. I mean, typically for right now, we're just going to leave it as the default. It's good enough for what we need to do. Um, but there's a lot of capabilities that this, we can set for this particular user, what they can and what they cannot do um, within the collaboration service. Storage location. Uh, you can have multiple storage locations, but here we're just, we have one associated with this user. And we'll go ahead and create this. And the user is going to go ahead and now have uh, content. Um, or a content repository, I should say, uh, for this particular user. So if we flip back over to Workspace App from the user perspective, what you'll now see is before we had apps and desktops, now we have files. Uh, and they have their personal folders, and then there's nothing there yet. It's a brand new environment, so we can go ahead and add content in there if we wanted to for this particular user, and they can, this is where they start storing all their content. Um, in, in one of the other sessions, in the Geeks Guide session, they're going to go in a lot more detail on the different connectors, setting up storage zone connectors, setting up those, those personal cloud connectors uh, to connect into like OneDrive and Google Drive. So I've gone ahead and uploaded a couple documents, start populating this repository. And here you can see, I click on it. This is what the read-only viewer is. Um, you can see what the doc, you know, what the, this is a PowerPoint uh, presentation. You can kind of see. Uh, uh, what's, what's in this um, without actually downloading it and editing the file. Um, so you can scroll through the different, the different um, slides. Uh, from here, you can download it, you can edit it. You know, if you have three, like I said, if you have all 365, you'll edit it within there, or it'll edit with a local application. Um, so this one I went ahead and edited, and this is actually doing 365. And what you'll notice is it's actually using the embedded browser, because I had an enhanced security turned on, because um, that is the embedded browser and not Firefox or Edge or Chrome. And go ahead and make the change and go ahead and save it. I mean, that's basically what you're doing, is you're allowing a user to access this content directly from the workspace. So we've now incorporated content into this whole thing. And now the last thing we want to look at um, to really tie everything together in, in all these different services is to, to look at analytics. And so we're going to talk briefly about analytics today, but like I mentioned, I'll be delivering a full, full 45-minute session tomorrow on analytics that will do a very deep dive, a lot of demos within the analytics service. Um, so very exciting stuff. So Citrix Analytics essentially is what ties everything together and gives you the ability to secure your environment proactively. I think yesterday at Keynote, you guys saw some of the announcements that we had around performance analytics, which is very exciting. Um, for all our customers because you can start utilizing that today. And so, like I mentioned, we'll do a deeper dive on that tomorrow. Um, quick joke that Dan added, and this to me just goes to show that females are better than males, but that maybe I'm biased, <laughs> who knows? So we'll, we'll just go with that. So essentially what analytics does is that it can be divided into three parts, telemetry, analysis, and action. Telemetry is essentially grabbing all that information from your entire Citrix workspace from all the different services that you enabled, right? Tomorrow we'll also talk about some of the third-party integrations and some of the data sources of information that you could pull from external sources that aren't coming from Citrix. 
Once we have all that information, we'll send it to our, an to our analysis. So basically, this is machine learning, artificial intelligence, that will really get to know who this user is and what they do on their day to day. So think about it like a credit card company, right? Your credit card company is extremely familiar of the types of purchases that you do, where you do them, et cetera. And if you deviate from that behavior, it'll have an action associated with it. So maybe they'll give you a call, maybe they'll block your credit card, send you a text message, et cetera. Similar um, things around security analytics. We'll analyze a user and check for any behavior that's outside of the user's norm or outside of the organization's norms. And once we do that, we have, a, we have actions that we can take in order to protect your environment. So whether that's starting session recording, logging the user off, notifying an administrator, locking that user out, in order to protect that environment so that if you do have a malicious user or someone coming in and trying to infiltrate your environment, you can protect that proactively. We do this by creating risk scores, so we'll have risky users, medium users, and low users. And again, this is all done through machine learning algorithm that we have. And so we'll look at the user behavior and then based on that, put them in different buckets. And based on that, have different associated patterns or actions that will take place in order to protect your environment. Today, right now, we won't talk a lot about the performance analytics, but tomorrow we will be talking about the performance analytics and how you can proactively give your users a better um, behavior based on some of that performance analytics information. And so I think analytics is um, something that's very cool. Um, it's something that allows you as administrators to protect your environment proactively versus reactively. And we're doing all of this through machine learning, artificial intelligence. So don't let me down. Tomorrow I expect to see more of you than today at Dan's session, all right? I'm counting on you guys. And so now Dan is going to take us home and talk a little bit about what we talked in the past almost 45, 50, I don't even know minutes. Quite a while. Um, so <laughs> it, it's basically we, we hit with the building blocks for the whole workspace. And this is what the next nine sessions we're going to much deeper on here. So we have, you know, gateway. It's incorporating our on-prem virtual app and desktop environment. Um, it's also providing a single sign-on. From there, you incorporate um, access control and secure browsing. That's going to give you the enhanced security for those web and SaaS applications uh, to give you that website filtering, you know, locking down, restricting what a user can and cannot do within those types of applications. Uh, expanding that to the whole endpoint, just looking at the managing our local and mobile applications and then growing beyond that and managing the devices themselves with different device-based policies as opposed to app-level policies. Incorporating the content from the different repositories so a user only has to go to a single place to get all their content regardless of where it's all stored at. And then pulling all this information together using you know, the machine learning, understanding what the user is doing, how they interact with the data, how they interact with the applications uh, to make sure that who's actually doing this type of stuff is the person who should be doing it. Um, so that you don't have all this data theft or data is being encrypted or accessing things that they shouldn't be or the performance is right uh, for the environment so an admin doesn't just have to sit there and monitor it constantly. So that's the overall um, architecture that we built, and that's what we'll be going into more detail in the next sessions. So the very next one, which will be right here, right after lunch, is uh, where we will be looking at identity. Um, so it's going to be... Basically, it's bring your own identity. You know, we've heard of bring your own device. This is bring your own identity. So using Workspace, you aren't limited to Active Directory and Azure Active Directory. You can use pretty much any identity you want now. And we're going to go through uh, this topic and talk a little bit more about you know, time-based one-time passwords, the federated authentication service. So I don't know how many of you know Martin Zuzek, but he's going to be up here with me. So it should be quite an interesting, uh, interesting session. Um, there might be one or two more Chuck Norris jokes in that session, too. Um, but with that, I'd like to thank everyone for attending, and that's my slow clap. <laughs>